Hi, so it's nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Kyla Davilia. I'm a second year PhD student at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science, and I'm excited to share my project with you today that NERSC resources have really enabled. Uh, superionic properties of HCNL materials uh, studied with ab initio and machine learning molecular dynamic simulations. So first I thought I could introduce you to my group briefly. I work with Professor Burkhard Melitzer, also here at UC Berkeley in EPS and astronomy. Um, our group really focuses on doing simulations of warm, dense matter. Um, so that would mean like atomistic simulations at super high pressures and temperatures, which we use to study the behavior of matter, uh, yes, at really high pressures and temperatures relevant for fusion, relevant for planetary interiors. Um, so I thought I could give you a few examples of other work that our group has done beyond what I do. The primary code that we use is VASP. Uh, though I have also often used DeepMD and LAMPS for machine learning capabilities, and my advisor also has a handful of Monte Carlo codes. So here on the far left, you see some work uh, discussing mixing of rock and ice at super high pressures and temperatures. In the middle is an example of uh, like helium diffusion through quartz nanocrystals. And on the right is an example of a super ionic isosurface in a super high pressure phase of water. This basically is showing the pathways that protons will diffuse through the cell and where they are most likely to exist in the structure. But my research is focused on studying superionic properties of what we call HGNO materials, or that is materials that are primarily composed, or I should say exclusively composed of the elements hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Um, so to define superionic, uh, a material is superionic if it has um, like a stable structure of heavy elements um, with light elements such as hydrogen, helium, lithium, sodium, diffusing throughout like a liquid. Um, so I'll give you an example of what that looks like. Uh, these simulations were performed for CSH7, uh, which at the time that I ran these had just been predicted to be a high temperature superconductor at very high pressures. Um, and so on the left, you'll see a solid. And so in this case, you see that it has this uh, crystalline structure, fairly regular. Atoms are vibrating because it is at high temperature or finite temperature, I should say, uh, but nothing's diffusing. On the far right, you have the opposite example. It's a liquid. And so this means all crystal structure has decomposed. All atom types are diffusing, albeit with different speeds given their different uh, atomic masses. But on the right is what I have, or sorry, in the middle is what I focused on studying, which is a phase we call superionic. And so you can see that the carbon and sulfur here have maintained that regular crystalline structure. Uh, so those elements are still solid versus the protons are now diffusing through uh, like a liquid. And so uh, these are a couple of ways that we can visualize superionic diffusion. Um, here on the top left, we can see uh, what we call an MSD plot, mean squared displacement. And so uh, this is averaging how far atoms of a certain type have moved over time. And so for a solid, we would expect that to be virtually zero, which we see it is. On the right, however, we would expect the protons to have finite diffusion and actually be linear with time, which is indicative of Brownian diffusion, versus the other elements are totally stable. You can also visualize these with the trajectories, which I show on the bottom for the solid and superionic phases, which are interesting to see. Um, for the solid, you can see that the protons are really vibrating around their potential wells, but they are not diffusing. Um, but when you get to the superionic phase, you see that the oxygen and nitrogen start vibrating a lot more, but they're still fixed, but the protons are flowing pretty wildly throughout the cell. So you might be asking, why study HCNO materials? Uh, and I would say that understanding these materials at high temperatures and pressures is important for several reasons. Um, the first, the NIF laser at Lawrence Livermore National Lab surrounds their um, targets in these hydrocarbon liners. And so understanding the properties of hydrocarbons at these really high pressures and temperatures um, is important in that capacity. If you are more into astronomy, uh, white dwarf stars are primarily co composed of hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen, also helium. Um, my favorite application, uh, HGNO materials are crucially important for the interiors of ice giant planets Uranus and Neptune. So these planets formed so far from the sun, they were beyond what we call the frost line. So that means past this distance from the sun, water, methane, and ammonia were solids. And so as these planets formed, they picked up huge amounts of ices in the solid phase, which is how they got so big. 
Um, but now that they're planet sized, the interiors are super high pressure and temperature. Um, and water, ammonia, and methane have combined into these interesting molecular mixtures, um, which, as we found in our study, exhibit superionic behaviors across a wide pressure and temperature range. So then you also might be curious, why should we study superionic properties? So superionic materials are really interesting because they have these charged particles flowing through them that makes them conductors, often at pressures and temperatures too low for the material to be electronically conducting. Uh, here we would call it ionically conducting. Now this is interesting for energy science because a lot of solid state batteries operate with superionic materials. Um, in these cases, it's the charged ion that serves um, as the conducting element. Um, so this is more of like closer to room temperature and pressure than what I study and lithium is the most popular element for these diffusers. Going back to our favorite planets, uh, superionic behavior is really interesting for Uranus and Neptune. Uh, because these materials are conducting, they can be really important for the magnetic fields in these planets. So Uranus and Neptune have these really strange magnetic fields, like Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, it's perfectly axisymmetric, it's perfectly dipolar. I think we all can envision what Earth's magnetic field looks like. Uranus and Neptune, it looks nothing like that. It doesn't have the same symmetry. Um, and there's been a lot of suggestions why, but the best model so far is that their magnetic field is generated in the outer regions of their planet, and like this thin convecting shell in the upper mantle. Um, so at these pressures and temperatures, it's most likely that the materials that are generating the magnetic field are conducting convecting planetary ices, uh, much like the ones I've studied. So I simulated 13 hydrogen bearing ices. Uh, they're listed on the right at a range of pressures and temperatures. So think 50 to 500 GPA and 500 to 7,000 Kelvin. Um, and we found that all of these materials became superionic, which was interesting and not necessarily expected because a lot of high pressure hydrocarbons will decompose into diamond and H2 gas. Um, so we weren't sure what would happen with these H2O materials that contained carbon. Um, we also noticed some really interesting trends related to the concentration of protons in the structure. So like here on the top left, I plot the fraction of protons versus the temperature that the material becomes superionic. So we find the more proton rich a structure is, the lower the temperature it will become superionic. Uh, conversely, if it's very hydrogen depleted, it becomes superionic at a much higher temperature. Um, we'll skip B and C, but then looking to plot D on the bottom right, um, I was able to calculate the ionic conductivities of these materials across this broad pressure range. So we also do see that the more proton rich a structure is, it has a higher uh, ionic conductivity. And so this was interesting because these ranges are very reminiscent of water and ammonia in this pressure and temperature range, which is interesting because almost all planetary modeling has involved using those equations of state. So here we're able to show that broader uh, planetary ices have very similar conductive properties, at least in terms of ionic conductivity. So of course, we are limited in the system sizes and time scales we can use with VASP. Um, I think the longest simulation I was ever able to run was about 70 picoseconds with maybe like 200 atoms. And then my advisor threatened to take my computer time away if I ever ran a simulation that long again. Um, so we wanted also to like be able to explore other transport properties of these ices that are not easy to simulate using uh, DFT, using so few atoms. And so we've been working on generating machine learning potential so that we are able to explore these materials at these larger system sizes and time scales. So I thought I could tell you a little bit how, about how this works for atomistic simulations. So you have to start by running, frankly, a very large number of simulations using DFT, because it needs a lot of data to train on across a broad pressure and temperature range. And I would also say I found that you need a sufficiently large cell to train on, which is something like 300 atoms. Uh, it did not work for us at all with like 100 atoms. Um, so I would say to do these, you actually have to want to do something really cool with the potential because the input data is very expensive to begin with. But then so you have all of these DFT uh, outputs. So you have atomic configurations, energies, forces on the atoms. If you're so inclined, you can train on virial information. And from there, you feed all of this into a neural network, which interpolates the data. And this is an iterative process. It's not good the first time. And you have to run more data um, to kind of fill in the gaps. And from all of this, it's able to generate, hopefully, a fairly accurate potential energy surface related to where the atoms are relative to each other. Um, 
And from this, you are able to generate forces on all of the atoms and run highly accurate, uh, but much, much faster uh, molecular dynamic simulations. Um, so I'm still working on broadening into actual applications of this. We've just kind of finally gotten this to work. Uh, but I thought you might like to see what superionicity looks like in these very large simulations. So you can see the protons basically start diffusing immediately, very rapidly. Um, they fill the cell immediately. I have highlighted a couple in like purple and green and blue, which you cannot see at all because the rest of them kind of snowball the cell. So then here I'm just showing those three ions again because I thought it would be interesting for you to see how rapidly and how far they're able to diffuse through the cell. So you can see why the ionic conductivity of these materials is really interesting. Um, getting a bit into the computational aspect, I wanted to highlight the incredible speed of the um, machine learning simulations relative to DFT. So using the Perlmutter GPU nodes, this large cell on the left is about 2,000 atoms. Uh, the cell on the right is 96. And the machine learning took 1 25th the time using half as many nodes. So it's absolutely wild. You need so much data to train them, but once you have them trained, it's incredibly fast. How much group... compute time do you need to train them? Actual computer time? Yeah, so, it, so it takes 1 25th once it is trained. Right. But if you need 25 times the, norm, the, the conventional simulation to train it, do you still come out ahead? That's a good question. I think that you come out ahead in terms of a cell this big is like literally not possible using DFT. Okay. So I think that sure. it's because it enables capabilities you don't it, have it otherwise. Yeah, but I don't think in terms of computer time you would actually save anything because the initial investment is so high. Well, but you could use it for other simulations, right? I mean, that's potentially a one-off cost of the training. Yeah, yeah. If you can use it for use a whole it, yeah. lot of different, like I, yeah. I do see that yeah. that that point. Okay, Lippy's waving at me that I need to hurry up. So, <laughs> um, our group was also really excited for Perlmutter uh, getting access to the GPU nodes because Perlmutter was so much faster using VASP too. It was incredible using like four nodes versus six. We still got like a six time speed up. Uh, so this has really enabled us to use more simulations, bigger simulations, more materials. Uh, it's been incredible. And then switching to the GPU nodes for the machine learning was just like mind-blowingly good. Mm -hmm. um, the training, Perlmutter versus Cori, was something like 30 times faster, something that would take days, switch to something I could like run in the morning and play with in the afternoon. Um, the actual molecular dynamic simulations from this was mind-blowing. It was like 100 times faster using a fourth as many nodes. At this point, I think it might just be limited by the write speed. Um, I think that if I printed out less information, it would still go even faster. <laughs> Um, so to wrap up, I just wanted to express my thanks to NERSC for myself and for my group. Um, it's been really amazing contributing to my productivity during my PhD, my ability to learn a lot of types of simulations. This was my first experience working with high performance computing. I think it's been great uh, in large part because of the incredible user support, um, which has rapidly resolved any issues I've ever had. Uh, the extensive CPU and GPU time has enabled me to run many simulations, different materials. I mean, I presented on one project. This has enabled me to get multiple publications going early on in my PhD, uh, numerous different methods, um, and has really contributed to rapid progress to my first publication. Very excitingly, the work I just showed you, plus much more, is uh, hopefully about to be published in Nature Communications, so maybe I can tell you a little bit more about that next year. Uh, but again, myself and my group are all very grateful to Nurse Resources. Thank you. Yeah. So did you try an off the shelf neural network potential? Yes, I absolutely did. So we used DeepMD, Deep Potential for Molecular Dynamics, was developed in the last few years at Princeton. Um, it is very good, um, but I think there was still a little bit of like black magic involved with actually figuring out how to get the potentials to work for your own pressure, temperature, material range. So it was not necessarily just plug in one set of DFT data and it worked perfectly. But DMD has been very popular in recent years for this application.